Thanks so much, Andres. Thank you, Lucy, as well, for having us here. Um, it's, it's really nice. I mean, I kind of find I Am Weekend probably a unique event, I think, in the world. I think it, it's, uh, I had this discussion earlier with somebody outside, and we were talking about how, you know, communities are kind of very separated online, you know, but we don't really tend to kind of get together ever, and it's really a unique opportunity to kind of bring these people together, you know. And um, so, um, so, Alex, um, I'm Philip. Um, we are uh, creative applications on that. I mean, I think that's kind of how we all uh, began, pretty much. But it's kind of already evolved over the years. Um, it's, it's funny, whenever there's a presentation like this, we try to look back and see where we got to and how we got here where we have. Um, but it's really become you know, about the online platform. It's become about a magazine, you know, a physical magazine that we print. It's also become very much about the events. And then the most recently, a, a platform for digital art. So. Um, it's, it's really kind of, it's on the kind of day-to-day -day things that we do, it's really difficult to divide these things because there's so many overlaps between them. Um, and, and we're quite small, but you know, we, we have this kind of constant conversations about all these four things that we do. Um, but you know, if, if we were gonna try to describe it in the kind of the simplest terms, and this is not kind of where this stuff comes from, but actually it's kind of how you might begin to describe it, what it is. Um, it's some kind of c collision between these three things. Now, these three things, it's not, it's not really a new concept. It's been around for centuries. It's just that in the last kind of 200, 300 years, you know, these things have kind of been divided. Um, there's been kind of pulling and pushing in lots of different directions. And only now, in probably in the last like 30 years, we're seeing these things come together, and that's really thanks to the computer. Um, so, and when we think about the computer, you know, we, and we, the way we think about kind of technology, I think there's a kind of general misconception about technology thinking that it's something new. Um, it is new in its kind of manifestation, but actually something that's been us, with us for a very, very, very long time. But more importantly, it's really something that kind of mediates, you know, between us and the environment. You know, it's kind of how we engage with one another, you know, and I'm not talking just about the internet, I'm talking about you know, phones, I'm talking about tools, I'm talking about, you know, uh, clothes and how we make our clothes and other things and so on. It's really about an environment, how we describe the environment, and we do that through, through the technology. Um, but again, you know, when it comes to art or kind of creative creation, you know, we like to kind of think of the technology more as a, you know, as a tool, as a kind of collaborator, and as a medium. And these are the kind of, this is really the focus of all pretty much what we do. You know, these kind of three terms. That technology now, you know, that it's become so, and it's always been kind of really inherent part of what we do, there's very little discussion about, you know, what does it do to our kind of creative process and creative thinking. Um, so I've kind of, we picked, uh, chopped, um, okay. Um, so that's kind of mountain David O'Reilly with a little kind of thing on the side. But we've got a big three projects to describe because I think it's really difficult to imagine like what could these projects be. But it's really interesting is that none of these projects really fit any categories. And that's really what excites us the most. That we feel very comfortable in the zone where, where it's neither nor. Um, so this is, a, this is a game, if you want to call it a game, but it's more like an artwork, but it's a game but it's an artwork, but it's a game. Um, and it's, um, it's actually a mountain that you interact with, but the only way you can interact with it is that you can just look at it, and it just does its own thing. And from time to time, you can zoom in, you can see what happens with it, and so on. It's really an amazing game, and it's worth, really worth checking out, because it's really unusual take on both the games and the artworks. Um, this is another project by Kimchi and Chips, which is a, they've set up two projectors, really strong projectors, and they've got loads of, kind of oval mirrors set up in a, in a grid. So what happens is that they're using the software to calibrate these projectors in a way where they can literally position a pixel where the lights reflect and intersect in space. So it's a little bit like a hologram, but it's not really a hologram. But you, know, you kind of have to watch the video to see what's going on. Like the spheres are just moving in space, just using light. Um, so it's, it's um, I mean, is it, is it kind of science? Is it, is, is it art or is it? You know, mathematics, you know, I mean, it's, it's really, really hard to kind of pinpoint it. Um, 
Here's another project, like really, really superb project by Benedict Gross, which is, um, it's easy to kind of look and go, oh, it's an agricultural project, but then, you know, maybe it's a land art at the same time. He's actually developed a particular algorithm that enables him to combine crops in a way that it's not just more uh, beneficial to how the crops grows, but also by making kind of beautiful patterns. You know, because kind of the machinery now on the fields is all GPS driven. I don't know if you know, but you actually position the kind of equipment on the field, and then you can just put the kind of the machine on the, you know, to um, plant seeds, and it will just run by itself. So you can actually create patterns the way you want. So he's kind of created this thing, and this is kind of one of the early images of the project. It actually gets um, the grass kind of grows really high, and then it creates even more beautiful patterns. So it's definitely worth checking out. But more importantly, it's it's. You know, it's artists and designers that are really kind of giving us an insight into what's coming next. You know, they're the ones that are kind of almost testing this stuff before the market, before the kind of the, 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 the large um, kind of communities adopt the products or ideas or they kind of accept some kind of concepts and stuff. Because artists, have done, they, they dare, you know, they dare to investigate, they, they dare to kind of ask questions about these things. Um, so, but more importantly, it's kind of, there's been also a shift and I think it, in, in kind of what we do is also very important that to recognize, and we try to recognize artists as, as, as designers, as researchers. You know, it's not about anymore, when it comes, well, particularly when it comes to technology, it's not really about kind of this kind of reactive behavior. I'm kind of reacting to a condition. It's not just that, but it's actually I'm kind of reacting to a condition in a kind of continuous, critical, kind of asking questions, researching, positioning kind of way. And, um, Christopher Fraying from RCA kind of did this really worth, uh, worth investigating and reading a paper um, which kind of tries to really categorize like what kind of research could an artist or a designer do? And even though that kind of sounds like, oh well, you know, he can spend a couple of hours in the library and he can look up things, but actually how do you now kind of really describe this research that an artist does? Um, but so, so you kind of all really begin with CAN, which is creative applications in that. And I'll let Alex kind of talk a little bit about it. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so um, hi, I'm Alex. And um, as Philip just said, uh, uh, creative applications, or CAN as we call it, is how it all got started. Uh, CAN is a blog that uncovers, collects, and uh, categorizes uh, forward-thinking work at the intersection of art, science, and technology. You know, the stuff that Philip just uh, described. And, um, you know, we, we still have difficulties to, to define these things, to categorize these things. And um, so the stuff that we write about on CAN can be anything from software art, interactive installations, data visualizations, sound objects, kinetic sculptures, or audiovisual performances, and many other weird new things that we, ha that we yet have to find or make up categories for. Um, and uh, just some uh, facts, uh, ICANN was f uh, founded in two th 2008. We have published about, uh, or more, I should say, uh, than 3,000 articles uh, since. Uh, we have about 20 guest writers, and uh, we are read by about uh, 1,500,000 ,000 people per month. Uh, and what I personally appreciate about CAN as a contributor, contributor is that uh, we don't really feel any pressure to, to run eight posts a day to, you know, to meet certain traffic goals. We really take our time and we are very careful, if not hesitant, um, about the things that we write about. And um, so how often we write about things really depends on whether we find something interesting or interesting enough to write about. Um, so, and that can be two posts a day or none. Um, and it's also funny because I think there is this kind of general thinking that, you know, if we haven't done a post, it means that we are too busy lazy, kind of yeah. doing other things, but we weren't. We actually, we spend hours and hours of talking and, you exactly. know, but we couldn't really... Yeah, yeah, and, and, and it's like we have this internal thing, you know, where, like, you spend the whole day looking at the internet, looking for interesting stuff, and then you have nothing to show for at the end of the day <laughs> because you just couldn't find anything that was worth writing about. Mm. And I think that sets Ken apart from many other blogs or how other blogs operate. And um, yeah, I don't know if that makes us reluctant bloggers or not, but I think the readers really get it and they appreciate it. And um, um, I think over the years we have realized that there's a real value in not trying to be big, but uh, uh, there's value in actually being small and being very considerate and very selective. and. Uh, 
um, yeah, about what you write and how you write about it. And um, yeah, that's something I really appreciate. And, and this selectiveness, I think, allows us to, um, to build uh, an audience, a readership that is very loyal and, uh, and invested. And you build reputation and trust. And I think that's kind of undervalued when you, you know, start to think about traffic and search engine optimi optimization and these things. It's kind of like, it's, 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 it's kind of two ways. It's kind of one is kind of being big and having an impact and the other one being niche and having an impact. And you know, they both kind of carry the same value. So being small, well, it's not really small. I mean, for a lot of blogs, we're kind of quite big. But um, you know, being that kind of size enables you to kind of comfortably kind of sit back and not publish anything you know, and be selective. Um, it's a little bit kind of shooting yourself in the foot, but at the same time, kind of looking back. I mean, there's so many times that I posted something that I really felt bad about afterwards. So like, oh, I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have done that. Yeah, or oftentimes we write a post and then we uh, get into a heated discussion internally whether it's worth posting or not, and yeah. then we just trash it. Yeah. <laughs> so that happens. Um, yeah, so um, what's interesting about the web is that reader investment is kind of difficult to measure. Yes, you can measure traffic and clicks, et cetera, et cetera, but how much people care about stuff is, does not always come across because you're not talking to the reader all the time. Um, but investment comes pretty clear when you do something that uh, kind of brings the community together or that adds value to, to what you're doing. And we did something like, or we realized that in 2012 when uh, we asked the Cannes readers to support a new project that we were working on, uh, a printed magazine that uh, um, the idea behind it was to engage with the readers in a different way, in a slower way, to engage with them outside of the blogosphere and above that churn and, um, and kind of expand on the conversations that we had online, on the web, on the blog, into a different medium. And um, so yeah, we, we launched a Kickstarter and we were blown away by the response. Um, uh, we reached our funding goal within five days and in the end we had more than 200% of what we asked for. And I think, I, I, don't, I don't say that because I, I'm, you know, I, I wanna brag about those numbers, but I think it, it really speaks to the, to the relationship that we have with our community. And I think for many uh, uh, people who supported the magazine, it was not just about getting getting a magazine, but it was also about giving something back. Mm. Um, and it's right. Also, oh. It's also what's interesting about Cannes, you know, in another example of it, that the blog itself is now kind of become pretty much a community-supported website. It, it has around 1,000 members that actually pay membership every, yeah. every year, you know, quite comfortably, and they don't really have a problem with it. I think I just got like two new members today. They just signed up, you know, and it's really just about Kind of being open and saying, well, you know, we need the support to keep this running. You know, I, we hope that you'll be with us and we'll keep this alive with us. So it's it's um, there's always alternative ways of. You know, sorry. So um, yeah, the, the magazine. Um, I think uh, it's we had some pretty amazing magazine talks yesterday. So mm. I'm actually very happy that they all came before me because um, that means that I can skip the part where I make a passionate. Uh, a case for the value of print in the digital age. You know, I have nothing to add what people have said uh, eloquently mm -hmm. yesterday, so that's fantastic. So what I, but what I want to do talk about, though, is how exactly um, the magazine expands on what we do on the web. And this is a perfect picture to illustrate what happens in the magazine. And this is uh, one of our photographers shooting data artist, Jer Thorpe, uh, with his uh, dog, Trapper John, uh, in the neighborhood of his uh, New York a uh, Brooklyn studio, and um, I think this speaks to the motivations behind the magazine because we felt, you know, when you look at projects or when you look at work, like project by project, like we do on the web, you know, that there's there's something missing. There's like a, uh, um, um, you know, you, you don't get to see the faces behind the projects. You, you don't look at career trajectories or how one work relates to another. And, um, and so we felt like we need to kind of step away from the web and actually step into the studios and the spaces where the work is created and, um, and yeah, get face to face with these practitioners and see, you know, uh, um, how they work on, on their stuff. To get a, because it completely changes how you, how you think about work, how you write about work and, and um, you know, and how it all fits into the big picture. Um, 
So the best thing about the magazine is that we uh, uh, get to spend time on content, much more time than we have on the web. Um, it can take up to six months for a, a, a feature to be really finished from photography, from writing and editing and going through like 10 revisions for, for a draft. Alex, um, Alex, Alex hates that I do a post on Can in 15 minutes. Yeah, I know, I know, it's, <laughs> it doesn't jive with me. Um, so, uh, yeah, and um, again, instead of talking uh, about this stuff project by project, we, we, we get to fully immerse ourselves into, into a practice uh, and into what somebody does. And we look at overarching themes and trajectories and how, um, yeah, how work also relates to history and what came before it and how it does connect mm -hmm. to cultural shifts that are currently taking place. So yeah, we get to really think hard and do a lot of research and a lot, do a lot of traveling to, to kind of craft these, these stories. Um, also, and I think that's very important, is by, um, by putting people front, front and center, by showing faces and spaces, I think that makes, that humanizes a lot of these really weird new works. It, it makes them kind of relatable or um, accessible, I should say, especially to a broader audience that just looks at these pictures and um, you know goes like, "What? What the hell is this?" <laughs> so by by showing the people that create this type of work and their thinking behind it and theoretical position positions, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, I think that really you know opens up this 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 world this this frontier to to a broader audience, which which we think is really important. And that's also how we. You know that also inf informs the language of the magazine. You know we try to steer away from the uh, uh, you know the technical terms and like speak more to you know yeah to in a way that everybody understands. Mm. Um, yeah. So and and lastly, um, I think coll collaboration is also fantastic. I mean, on the mm. blog, it's a very solitary experience. You write up a project or you have an email exchange and that's it behind your laptop. But uh, with Hole, we get to really put people together and uh, get them to do interesting stuff. Like we group uh, photographers with writers, illustrators. We have uh, exp niche experts, commentators that we bring in to kind of discuss these, these, these broader ideas. And um, um, yeah, and, and by kind of combining all these uh, talents together, and then in the end, obviously, editorial design is a big a deci a decisive factor. Um, yeah, so, so we get to kind of craft a package that not just uh, encapsulates six months of internet time, but also considers um, work and innovation and thinking that has been going on for decades. So yeah, uh, the magazine is our way to slow down and step back and kind of put everything into perspective. Um, yeah, the first issue was released last summer and it was received rather well, we're very happy. And um, the second one is uh, due. It's coming out in spring. Um, so yeah, check it out. <laughs> Good cross. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And, it's, and I think we also, we also got to spend quite a lot of time thinking about the magazine. You know, you know it still needs to operate Can as a magazine. Can you go back to the slides? So? All right. Okay. Um, so it still kind of needs to operate as a magazine. It still has to offer the reader that kind of reading, good reading experience. But we always question, like, what does it, you know, when we evolve artists to help us, you know, with kind of the design of the cover and other things, you know, we kind of always try to rethink, well, what kind of, you know, how does the magazine change now that we have a generative artist kind of working on the cover? You know, is it just about the cover or there's a really inherited idea that is carried through the magazine and so on? So it really kind of feeds the stuff that we see, the stuff that we learn, also feeds that back into the magazine and the design of the magazine. But, you know, events have also been kind of a really important part of what we do in the last couple of years. Um, it's, it, 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 I mean, it's incredible kind of doing these things when you, when, you, when, you, when you get the feedback from the community, such as on Kickstarter, but then you kind of all, you create an opportunity where everybody meets and kind of everybody gets together. Um, I actually, I don't know why, but you know, I have people that I know, friends that live kind of a few streets away from me in London, and I only see them like at festivals in the other part of the world, you know, which is really kind of strange. And we're kind of quite comfortable kind of in that kind of mode, is that we use these events as, as ways to kind of get together to exchange and so on. And it's really, I mean, it's really grown over the years. I mean, it's uh, in the last, since we launched, I mean, some of the numbers, that these are the, some of the people that we brought at the events, you know, some of the artists that we brought to the events. Um, and the most beautiful thing about kind of organizing events, you know, such as this one, is that you can kind of stand back and you can watch people interact, you know, and that's one of the things. Um, I, I, I hate events because I don't have fun, but then I love them because I can stand back and I can kind of get all depressed and busy and stressed, but then I can see other people engaging. And that's really, really important 
for our community at least. But another part of this, it's been about this, this idea of kind of digital art. I mean, how do we, you know, if it is about digital art, it's about the kind of this technology having an impact on art and changing art in many ways. You know, how does, how does one enjoy it? You know, I think it's fine to kind of go to exhibitions and go to um, kind of events such as festivals, you know, but how do we create a kind of platform that enables people to own a piece of it? You know, and I think that's always kind of been an issue and it's been the problem for the last 50 years or so. It's not kind of the first time. And the, the kind of the ado adoption of digital art by the, by the art market has been a kind of difficult one, a difficult path. Um, but, you know, when we think about art, we kind of think of the, kind of by the slide on the left. You know, that's the kind of the traditional way of looking at the art. But in the same way, the same kind of traditional way, what art actually is, is kind of what you see on the right, and that's the old art market. That's the kind of the bad visualization of, of, an, of, of an art market and how it functions. So these are the kind of the relationships between different galleries, different collectors, different museums, kind of owning different things, and so on. So when we think about art, we don't... We shouldn't really think about it as this thing on the wall. Sure, that's like kind of one manifestation of it, you know, this visual manifestation. But for artwork to be an artwork or to be kind of authenticated as an artwork, it needs to belong in this, you know, because if it doesn't belong in this, it kind of doesn't exist. You know, it's a kind of replica or it's something that was found in, you know, Hitler's ex-basement or whatever it is. But, yeah. but um, we've kind of looked at this idea in 2010 when Can was kind of doing it, there was quite a lot of things happening on the kind of the iOS front. And we, kind of, we were wondering like whether iOS could be a potential environment or a platform for digital art, whether artists could actually create things and we could, as, as users, we could collect these things. Um, and it was really inspired by, by um, Source Label, which came a year before that was launched by the THA in Japan. Um, and this was kind of uh, driven around the idea of kind of screensavers, because before we didn't have uh, iOS platform in 2009, and this was really about kind of the screensavers. How could we bring art to the screensavers, and you could buy them and you could collect them? Um, so our response was, well, let's try to do that with the iOS. So let's try to create apps. Let's try to work with artists to bring these iOS apps, you know, a kind of interesting iOS apps to the to the. And it was really it was really working really well in the beginning, you know, before it kind of got too big and out of control and you know, all that stuff that happened with iOS, and now it's all like angry birds. Um, but um, at the same time, THA was really thinking, kind of with the lead of Yugo Nakamura, he was really thinking, well, how do I display this stuff? You know, how do we like, okay, fine, I can kind of collect it, I have these files, but then how do I display it? And this is kind of how Framed came about. And Framed is really trying, and it's quite new, it was on Kickstarter last summer, but it was really launched around 2012, but now it's kind of um, accessible. Um, so we've, uh, together with Can, we've been kind of working with Framed and closely with Framed, trying to build and develop this, this, this platform. But what's interesting when you start thinking about digital art, or you start thinking about a digital object more specifically, is that you kind of have to think about it as this, you know, idea rather than manifestation, rather than a kind of thing that you see. You know, so the, the digital object is something that is at kind of top level, and then it has kind of different manifestations at location A, location B, location C, and then they can all kind of talk between themselves, and then I have like the web front, and they have a physical manifestation, and so on. So really thinking about the digital not as, you know, kind of an artwork that, you know, just we see, but actually an ecosystem. You know, an ecosystem such as the kind of the market or the art market, you know, where these things belong, where they sit, and we kind of collect them. And then they can collect kind of different versions of them, and we can kind of uh, grow with them. You know, these things can develop, they can mature, they can become something else, and so forth. So, so it's really exciting working with Framed, you know, trying to shape this platform and really kind of look at ways, you know, how digital art might kind of develop and become something that we could all kind of own or collect or grow with. Um, but um, this is how we um, work. Um, it's really strange, but you kind of see me and Alex on stage, but this kind of we hardly ever happens. We're hardly ever in the same room. Um, most of us are hardly ever in the same room, and that's kind of slightly bizarre and very unusual that uh, we are kind of spread out, and we work like 24-7, like 24 hours a day. It's basically open channel. And uh, I could wake up, I couldn't sleep like at 3 a.m. I could get online, and probably like, Greg would be in Toronto just having his dinner, and I could have a conversation about something. Or uh, Alex will be in Berlin, I'm in London, um, Framed is in Tokyo, in Taiwan. So there's this kind of like a constant 
conversations going. I mean, it doesn't really stop, and it's um, and it's really. I mean, I don't think I've ever. I mean, what's your experience with? Like, um, it's. Uh, it's. I think it's. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I've never. I've never had that with any other project before, and uh, I find it really this open channel. It's like it's almost like a substitute for a studio. Like you're in the same space, but you're not. Yeah. You know what I mean? And um, uh, yeah. And this is kind of the kind of the organization of it. I mean, we kind of try to make sense of it all, and you know, it's it's about partnerships, the magazine. You know, who's kind of in charge of what? I mean, it's. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I'm terrible at, I'm terrible at drawing diagrams. They kind of, but you love it at the same time. Mm -hmm. Alex always takes the piss, but you know, I kind of, you know, it makes perfect sense to me, <laughs> but nobody else. But um, but yeah, we kind of try to make sense of this. You know, how who is charge of what, and you know, but there's always these overlaps. You know, kind of contributions. You know, kind of one feeds to the other. We have conversations, even though the guys are not so involved with framed. It's mostly me. You know, they still feed back and give opinions, and we talk about the art and the work that could be on there and so on. So there's a lot of kind of overlaps. But um, but one of those actually before I go on there, um, one of the really I mean, kind of talking about the future now because we go like four minutes and nine seconds. Um, Talking about the future now, really thinking like, where do we go from now? And even though there's all these kind of exciting things happening, it's really about there's only so much you can grow within your own ecosystem, you know. And I think that's the that's the kind of the, the something that we're learning as we're going, as we're maturing. Is that um, sure? You know, you know, we can start publishing like all kinds of things, and we'll just grow in numbers, and we'll get bigger and bigger and bigger. But you know, does that mean getting bigger? Does it mean that you provide more value? And I don't think that's true. And I think the only way you can provide value is by actually working with other people, you know, the people that are outside of your kind of comfort zone, you know, kind of meeting somebody that just hates what you do, you know. Um, um, so, so this is the kind of the top bit, which is the partnerships. It's something that we'll be trying to develop. And partnerships not in the sense of kind of walking up to somebody and saying, well, can you give us some money and we'll just kind of like really promote the hell out of you. Um, but rather kind of saying, well, how can you help us and how can we help you? And that's really been the focus for the next, for the last probably like six months and I think it's probably gonna be the focus for the next year or two years. Um, so it's really kind of working, not just festivals, but also working with, um, you know, kind of tool makers, so working with art organizations, work about, work with, um, uh, I don't know, I mean, all kinds of different kind of organizations, really, like uh, brands even, like, um, and, uh, and so on. But um, I want to, uh, kind of, we should close, because we've got two minutes. We're going to be left with one minute, I think, um, if we time the world. But uh, to close, kind of, with two, two quotes. Um, this is a quote that I really love, um, kind of futurist, Alberto Giacometti, but what he says, it's really, really interesting, is that, and it really applies to everything that we do. Um, it's really that, you know, you to kind of understand something, like really fully understand it, sometimes you have to go really, really far in almost kind of silliness, you know. You know, if you want to really understand this, you kind of have to go over and over and over again and look at it from all the different angles. And we kind of try to do that with the magazine, and we try to understand why these things are the way they are, you know. And that kind of asking those questions is the only way that we're going to move forward, you know, rather than accepting things for the way they are. And that's really, really super important. Finally, um, again, another misconception about technology. You know, it is really kind of what we are. It describes us. It makes us, you know, who we are. So that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.